like uh, we were renewed for the new season, so we're, <laughs> so we're okay. Yeah. Um, uh, my friend and I uh, agreed recently to pay for something together, and uh, then we lost. Um, he was going to pay me back for the part he owed, but then we lost the receipt. So exactly how much he owed is, is now a bit of a suffix. So should he underpay me uh, to avoid, and I forgive him for the whatever he owed me to avoid ribis? Because if he fully pays back, he might slightly overpay me, and then there's a ribis I left. Should he underpay me to avoid this problem? Yeah, now that, that's an interesting question. So first of all, let me, let me just mention uh, the, the, the particular issue that you're raising. And that is, uh, you owe somebody money, and uh, you don't, neither of you remember how much it is. So, the, so, but you know it was not beyond a certain amount. So the question is, who from people? Uh, they want to do everything right. They want to uh, keep the halacha. So the problem is, uh, to pay the highest amount that it could be, could theoretically be interest. I'm just explaining, right? Because if, if it was only $10 and you pay $15, the five dollars are interest. On the other hand, if you underpay what you owe, uh, it turns out you're stealing. So to simply say, let's be machmir, let's be strict, doesn't really answer the question because there is potentially a prohibition in whatever direction you go. Uh, extra payment would be a question of uh, interest and underpayment would be a question of, of, of gezel. So the truth of the matter is, uh, there's a way to get around either of those problems, meaning certainly uh, if you agree to the lower amount and you're mochel, whatever thing is extra, then there's no gazela problem because you were mochel. Now, uh, interest may be more of a problem because you can't be mochel interest, meaning let's assume that I voluntarily want to pay you extra money for borrowing uh, money so even though I'm doing it without compulsion, it's still considered interest. So in fact, that explains an interesting little anomaly, if I could digress for a moment. The laws of borrowing money are in Choshen Mishpat. Choshen Mishpat is the chilek of Shulchan Aruch that deals with business law, Choshen Mishpat. You would expect that the laws of interest ought to be connected to Hilchos Malva Velova. And indeed, in the Rambam's Mishneh Torah, all the laws of ribis are under Hilchos Malve Velove. But in the Shulchan Aruch, it's very, very strange. Hilchos Malve Velove is in Choshen Mishpat. Hilchos Ribis is in Yoridea with the laws of Kashrus. Why would the laws of ribis be in the same part of the Shulchan Aruch dealing with the laws of Kashrus? And the difference is, because most matters of money can be negotiated by mechila, right? If the halacha says, I owe you X amount of money, you could agree to pay more or agree to pay less, you know, uh, and therefore it's adjustable. But ribis is not subject to mechila. Even if I'm mochel by being willing to pay extra, there's still a ribis prohibition. And that's why ribis is, along, is closer to kashras, right? You can't negotiate out of kashras. Uh, ribis is actually closer to kashrus than it is to monetary laws generally. So based on all of that, it would appear that underpayment with mechila would be better than possible overpayment with ribis. However, uh, that's not mochrich because it's entirely possible that there is a svara that any type of overpayment that is being done because it's a suffake, if you owe that amount of the money, is bichlal not called an interest payment at all. So I think the svaras can go either way, but just to be sure that there's no violation, the <coughs> underpayment with mechila is the safer way to go. Yeah. I heard a midrashic concept once that um, every animal in the ocean is, there's a connected oh. animal on land, uh, including humans. So I wanted to see if the Rebbe could explain about that. And, and kind of a part B to that is, is there a Jewish view on mermaids? <laughs> yeah, um, so, so there, is, there is a chazal that says that uh, everything on the land has a parallel uh, to the ocean. Uh, so you, know, you have sea lions, you know, di different types of things that resemble in some way. Sometimes it's not so clear that there's a resemblance, but on some level uh, they are said to, to resemble. And uh, therefore that would suggest that there would be creatures in the sea uh, that we, we would resemble human beings. However, that doesn't lead you to the issue of the mermaid or whatever, because the mermaid is conscious, right? The mermaid 
uh, is essentially like a human being. And Chazal were not making that claim. Chazal were never stating that just as you have intelligent human life on earth, you will have that same type of intelligent life with a divine soul or something uh, in the sea. So as a result, I don't think halacha would directly, or this medrash would directly support the idea of a mermaid. It would support that you'd find some humanoid creature. I'm not sure what that would mean in the sea. Now, let me just point out, though, although this is not directly your question, there's a pasuk in Eiv where Eiv is talking about the wonders of nature. A lot of the book of Job uh, is a contemplation of the niflos habore. That's part of the book's idea that we don't really understand God because we don't understand the sun and the moon and the stars and all the different wonders. So if you like nature, uh, the book of Eve is actually a book that has very, very beautiful descriptions of animals and nature and the like. And it talks about the idea of making a covenant, making a bris with the adne hasada. Uh, the rocks, avne or adne, same thing, of the field, uh, which simply means, the simple meaning would be that uh, God will protect you from rocks and the like, but Rashi brings a chazal that adne hasada are actually human-like creatures that resemble like what we call apes or whatever it would be that are kind of human-like and they're very, very dangerous, and they're tied to the earth. The earth is like their umbilical cord. And what Rashi is referring to is Rashi referring to some type of thing that we would describe as a prehistoric man. Uh, is that an ancestor of Adam, or is that a totally different type of species? But Rashi does bring from Chazal that there are uh, human-like creatures who are not human, now, that's talking about a land-based one. Uh, there might be a sea-based one uh, by, by analogy. Uh, but I'm not aware of any direct reference to, uh, to mermaids. Uh, yeah? Uh, your descendant. Uh, why did Chazal seemingly create such a complex process for the brachos on food? Even today, there are many debates among post-game, e.g. brachos on desserts and a bread meal, brachos on the topping on a cracker, risotto spread, yigar <laughs> and sofel, et cetera, et cetera. Since food is such an intrinsic part of a person's life, it seems the laws are very complicated for the average person to grapple with. Yeah, very, very true. The laws of brachos are very, very complicated, and it's pretty strange, too, because brachos is an area of halacha that we have to introduce people to at a pretty young age. I mean, if you have a child, right, you start teaching your child to make brachos, you know, whatever it is, to age four, age five, uh, etc., and yet, it's immensely, immensely, immensely complicated. And that's why we have books in English and Svarim in Hebrew that are hundreds of pages long with all sorts of, of questions, like every single thing you, you buy in the market, you know, what bracha do you make on granola bars and rice cakes and, and, and you know, whatever. Everything is a shayla. So first of all, keep in mind the following. Uh, it's not that the laws of brachos are so complicated, it's the, uh, the production of food is so complicated. Meaning to say, in the good old days, uh, you know, food was pretty simple, and all of these, I'm not suggesting there weren't shilas, I mean, the Gemara itself discusses shilas, but it wasn't as complicated. I mean, a lot of the hilchos brachos problems we have is because of the advances or the complications of food additives and food technologies, and that creates a whole bunch of of, of, of questions. But if you're asking me in a more general sense, uh, why don't Chazal just make one, let's say, one big bracha on everything? Everything, you know. Um, this was a proposal, I think, um, when Trump was running for president in 2016. They didn't do this. Uh, he wanted to simplify the tax code. So it's simply like um, a flat tax. So it would simply say, how much did you make? 10% uh, of that is what? And that's the tax, the tax return would have been uh, two lines. Total income, 10% equals tax. So why didn't they just say, Shahakol is everything. Shahakol, right? Bidi Evid, Lemaisa, Shahakol, you are Yotze. At least Bidi Evid. But I think the answer there, I think we, we do have a general approach why the Hilchus Brachos are a bit more detailed, and that is, since the Yisod of Brachos is Hakara Satov, gratitude to God, Gratitude needs to be very specific and focused. You can't just say, oh, thank you, God, for everything. Rather, you got to think about the nature of an apple and the nature of a tomato and the nature of a pizza. Because as you get more focused, 
And as you see more detail and more nuance, your feelings of gratitude to HaKadosh Baruch Hu become sharpened. Uh, Rabbi Victor Miller's a cardinal of Racha, who really, one of uh, the themes of his life that he talked about for 60, 70 years of teaching was HaKara Satov. Uh, and this was largely based on the Chayvas Halavavas. The Chayvas Halavavas has a whole chapter called Shar HaBechina, which is how you look at the world and you see God's kindness by examining the world. You look at flowers, you look at color, you, lo you look at every little thing. So Rabbi Miller kind of updated it with all sorts of reflections. So one of his most famous discussions, uh, I haven't read it recently, but it's a very, very famous discussion, is what you should think about when you eat an apple. And it goes on like for 20 pages, uh, you know, uh, the color and the acidity and the sweetness and the texture. And then, you, then he, I think he updated it with a, a meditation on a banana, uh, which went in a different direction. And uh, the point he was making is that you can come to love God by thinking about an apple. You can love Hashem by thinking about a banana. You think about how HaKadosh Baruch Hu created these complex structures that are aesthetically beautiful, that uh, taste good, that are nutritious, you know? And these are all the chasadim that Hashem does for you because if the only need you had was survival, then God could have made food without taste, without smell, without color, you know, some type of stuff like they give you in the army, whatever it is, some type of glop that you just uh, ingest, uh, that would have been enough to keep you alive. But Hashem wants you to see, you know, get more than that. So a lot of the specificity of brachos is to focus our hakara satov so that we do develop a greater, greater generosity. Uh, but as I say, a lot of the complications of brachos do come from food technology rather than the dynamic of the halacha itself. Yeah? Um, if Hashem knows everything that's going to happen, how can we have free will? Yeah, so uh, that's, uh, again, one of the most famous uh, questions of Jewish philosophy. Uh, we have two beliefs. Uh, number one, that I have free will. Every morning I wake up, I decide, should I daven, should I learn, should I serve Hashem, should I do Averis? God does not make me do any of those things. He doesn't make me sin, and he doesn't make me do good. Hakol bidei shamayim. Everything is in the hands of Hashem, chutz meyira shemayim, except your decision to serve God. That's called Bechira. The Rambam says in Hilchah's Tshuva that without Bechira, there could not be reward or punishment. How could I be responsible for doing Averos if I was programmed to do Averos? How could I get reward for doing mitzvos if I was just made that way, right? You don't reward a computer or a machine for functioning properly. So the whole Yesod of Scharvi Onesh presupposes autonomy, free will. Now, if you think about it, free will is absolutely a miraculous process because God controls everything. God is omnipotent. Nothing can be done without the will of God. And yet, Hashem, on his own, abdicated his power over my decisions in the spiritual realm. He lets me make my decisions. Right? We learned from the Torah Devorah that not only does he let me make my decisions, he's giving me life the very moment that I'm making those decisions even to go against him. Right? So he's actually helping me. Hashem is almost a co-conspirator because when I decide to do a sin, God is enabling me to do the sin by keeping me alive that moment. So that's principle number one. I'm just repeating your question. Principle number two is Hashem knows the future. He knows what you're going to do uh, today. He knew what you were going. He knows what you're going to do today. Yesterday, a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, a million years ago. So the question becomes: How can I have free will if, when I wake up this morning, Hashem already knew a million, trillion, gazillion years ago what I was going to do? So by the time I get up in the morning, the choice is already known. I don't have any choice to do other than what is already in God's knowledge base, right? That's a famous, famous question. And in fact, the Rambam himself asks the question. The Rambam says, how do we reconcile the free will uh, called Bechira 
with Hashem knowing the future, which is also a nikr of Amuna. So the Rambam himself gives an answer that, that maybe only a philosopher or a philosopher's, philosopher's mother would love. And the Rambam doesn't really answer the question. In fact, the Rambam's real answer is, I have no idea. But, but, but he, he makes it a little fancier by saying the following. He says, in the case of a human being, we can divide the human being from his knowledge. There's me and there is my knowledge. Right? Knowledge is something I have in me, but it's not me. God is an indivisible, simple unity. Meaning, there is nothing about God that can be divisible. We don't even understand what that means exactly, but you can't divide God in any way. So, the same way that there is God, there is God's knowledge, but God's knowledge is not separate from God. And therefore, the Rambam says, the same way we can't understand God, because he's infinite, we can't understand his knowledge, because God's knowledge cannot be separated from God's essence. Therefore, we don't know how God's knowledge fits the paradigm of free will. It's a very fancy way of saying it, but he says, philosophically, it's impossible. I mean, he's saying a little more. He's saying, it is philosophically impossible to answer that question, because if you can't understand the nature of God, and God's knowledge is the same as God's nature, then you can't understand the nature of the knowledge of God because that would be the same as understanding the nature of God. Right? So that's more of a fancy philosophical way of saying, don't know. Rivet, who all, often gets annoyed at the Rambam, uh, the Rivet says, hey, if you can't answer a question, don't bother asking it. He actually says, to the, says why is he even raising the question? So let me just give a little explanation of this. One of the ways that the Rambam is sometimes explained, that the, the Rambam actually is giving an answer, but the Rambam is making a point we can't understand the answer. And, and the answer the Rambam might be suggesting is that the whole question that how can there be free will uh, if God knows ahead of time only mm -hmm. makes sense as a question if you live in the realm of time, if you live in a temporal sequence of things, the past is earlier than the present, and the present is earlier than the future. So if God in the past already knows what I'm going to do, then when the present moment comes, I don't have free will, right? That's the question. But that's only a question if you're living within time. Now, with respect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, who is above time, past, present, and future are concurrent realities. I, I, even that's not a good way of putting it because concurrent is also time, but everything's at once. So like this. If I see you davening, if I see you davening right now, I'm not affecting your free will. I'm simply observing what you're doing in the present minute. God's knowledge of the future is like a human being's knowledge of the present because God is not within the framework of time. So even though God knows a billion years earlier what I'm going to be doing, he is simply observing me in the present moment and therefore he's not impacting on my free will. He is simply observing my free will because it is only in the framework of time that, you know, the word, he already knows. See, think, look at the words. He already knows implies a past that is earlier than a present. Uh, God does not view it, things from that perspective. God is viewing everything as happening in the concurrent moment. That is one explanation. Now, the Ravid himself offers his own explanation. After the Ravid doesn't like the Rambam's thing, the Ravid says, if you're asking a question, uh, you might as well answer it. If you can't answer it, don't ask the question. So the Ravid offers an answer, which is a little, little frightening in some ways, because uh, in his attempt to answer free will, right, this is his attempt to answer it, it almost appears that he's destroying free will. The Ravid says the following. The Ravid says, what does it mean to say that God knows the future? I mean, how can God know the future 
it hasn't happened yet. In other words, there's, there is no future to know. There is nothing to know. Right? I mean, there is no future. It hasn't happened yet. So, so assumes the rabbit, I mean, uh, and the like. So the rabbit says, God's knowledge of the future is in the nature of predictive accuracy. God knows your past because it happened already. So God's knowledge of the future is based on a prediction based on the past. Now, let's take a simple example. Let's say whenever you come home to mom, you know, uh, she gives you ice cream for desserts, and uh, mom is not into the 32 flavors. It's chocolate or vanilla, right? Those are the choices. For 25 years, you've, ordered, you've asked for vanilla every time, but mom always gives you the choice, chocolate or vanilla. Now, mom, after a while, should be able to predict that you're going to go for vanilla, although you might surprise her. So mom's predictive accuracy based on the past is probably 99.99999%, but there's going to be a possibility that she gets it wrong. The Rivet says that because God knows every single thing that ever happened to you, every single input into your personality, every single experience, every single word that someone ever said to you. So the Rivet says God can predict your future at a level of 100% accuracy, but it's in the nature of prediction rather than knowledge. Now, I'll tell you what is, what is a little scary about the Rivet. You know, there was a famous American psychologist at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, John Watson, who was the founder of a school of psychology called behaviorism that essentially denied free will, and Watson said, if you tell me everything that ever happened in your past, then I know automatically how you're going to respond in the future. And the only reason we don't know exactly how you're going to respond in the future is because we don't know everything that happened in your past. Now, it would seem that if the rivet is making the point that God knows every way you're going to respond in the future because he knows your past, that actually is a denial of free will because that's basically saying you are the total of the things that have already happened to you. L'chaira, free will, makes exactly the opposite point, does it not? Does not Bechira establish the idea that no matter what happened to me, I have the choice of going in another way. So the Ravid is changing knowledge of future to prediction of future as a defense of the concept of Bechira, but the Chara, one could ask a question that this does not defend Bechira, this may destroy Bechira, because you're telling me that all God has to know is everything that happened to you in the past, and then he knows your choices. Well, at that point, that means you don't have choices, because you're just inevitably going to follow uh, what you did in the past. So I'll leave that as a Tzorachian right now, but it's just something to think about. But again, uh, the question that you raised is a well-known question, and maybe, maybe again, maybe the best answer for our purposes would be that if God lives above time, God's knowledge of the future is simply seeing a, a present moment, and therefore uh, it's not that he knew before you made your decision, he is seeing you as you are making your decision. Yeah? Uh, is there a general policy in the uh, Orthodox world, and like the place in general, about being the Kabul I mean, Hagim from other groups, let's say like conservative reforms Jews, like for example, like a, a tune for Abdallah or saying certain <laughs> yeah. after Tefillah might come from different groups. Yeah. So is there a policy on the Pesachim that whether we should avoid this or if it's not harmful, then there's no reason to be uh, against it? Yeah, that's a very, very good question about uh, adopting things uh, from sources that may not be so kosher or halachic compliant. Uh, one example is the very popular, not everybody knows this, that's the thing, the very popular Abdallah uh, Nagunim that they sing in many places is, is actually from the reform uh, of Debbie Friedman, whatever, whatever. She was very popular in the conservative reform uh, movement. Uh, there are many Nagunim people sing that are from Chabad, and these are people who are very, again, Chabad, is, is, as far as I'm concerned, is very kosher, but I'm saying, but even people who would never allow anything from Chabad, there are plenty of Nagunim that come in uh, from Chabad that, that people are, 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 are singing. 
Uh, and then you even have, an occasion, you even have popular music. You have things from whatever it is, uh, other sources, sometimes even Christian sources, other times whatever it is, pop, popular music and the like of, of non-Jewish or we call trafe origin. And uh, somehow it comes in and uh, is there a, a policy, is there a shita, uh, should you use it, is it okay to use it? So I think you do have to really analyze this maybe from two perspectives. One is the minhag idea and the other is the music idea because music actually has some unique considerations that may go beyond generically, you know, borrowing uh, minhagim and, uh, and, and, and the like. Um, with respect to music, let me address that first. This is an old debate where Moshe has chuvas. There are Kabbalists that have uh, response on this of whether uh, a, a musical tune, is it tainted or affected by the source from which it comes, either by the composer or by the musician? Meaning, let's assume that something was Christian music. Or let's assume something came from a popular musician who was uh, a mushkas. Or a composer, right? The composers are not always that virtuous. Beethoven and, and these guys were not always the greatest tzaddikim. So do we say that somehow the music absorbs the bad midos and the mistakes, and therefore when the music is acting on your emotions, you're kind of absorbing some of those poisons? Now, the Kabbalists took such a position. They actually said the music kind of absorbs the feelings and the kavanot of either the performer or the composer, uh, either one. And therefore, if it comes from a not good source, it could affect you in negative ways. There were other opinions. Uh, mainstream halacha took the position that music is a neutral medium. And as a result, uh, wherever it came from makes no difference. Uh, you can take it for kedusha, and you can adopt it, you can elevate it, uh, you can use it. I remember I was, uh, uh, years ago, I was davening in the Mea Shorim Shtiblach, davening Mincha. It was around Hanukkah time, December, and all of a sudden, I'm hearing somebody's cell phone go off, and it's playing, you know, Silent Night, which is a you know, Christmas carol. Uh, and, you know, it's a little strange. Mayor Sharim have Silent Night. But some guy didn't, had no idea what it was, and he figured, yeah, he's a nice, a nice niggin, you know. So uh, <laughs> he, he, just put it, he just put it on his cell phone, right? But, you know, if you're uh, an American kid, you know, you know what it is. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you wouldn't think of putting a Christmas carol, you know, on your, on your cell phone or, or whatever it is. On the other hand, strictly speaking, a tune, uh, uh, unless you adopt the Kabbalistic position, a tune is a tune. In fact, as, as you know, there are numerous Hasidic stories, m much, much old Hasidic, not modern, but old, old Hasidic music came from Hungarian songs and, and Russian songs and Ukrainian songs, Lithuanian songs. And in fact, there are numerous maizim in the Hasidic world about uh, those songs themselves originally came from the Beis HaMikdash and the songs went into exile and the Rebbe had to redeem the nigan from the Tameh source so the Rebbe hears a shepherd singing a love song in Hungarian and the shepherd intends it as a romantic song and the uh, Rebbe says, sing it to me again, sing it to me again, because the Rebbe wanted to learn the song. And as soon as the Rebbe learned the song, the shepherd forgot it. The Rebbe reclaimed the song and used it uh, to, to establish the love between God and the Jewish people. So all I can tell you is it's, kind of an open, it's actually kind of an open debate. Uh, as far as I know, uh, other than the Kabbalists, most post have not raised objection to this type of, type of borrowing because we consider it to be neutral and uh, beneficial if uh, people benefit from it. What is it? The Altar of Slobodka kind of held, this is totally unrelated context, that if something works in your Avaita Sashem, it makes a difference where it comes from. <laughs> I don't know if the story was that um, somebody told him that some Talmidim uh, took a dead fish from the river and they put it on the table and they would stare at the dead fish for an hour thinking about Misa and death and how you have to do tshuva. And someone was complaining to the altar, these, these people are insane. I mean, they took a dead fish and they're staring at it. And the altar of Subhadra just asked one question. He says, did it work? 
uh, if it worked and if it helped them, okay, gesundheit. Hey, if it works, go ahead and use it. Uh, we have a similar issue. Uh, let me give you another, another issue that comes up a lot. Uh, yoga. Yoga and alternative medicine. This is actually a very, very big issue. Uh, yoga has its origins. There's no question that yoga has its origins in the Hindu religion uh, with some Buddhist, uh, Buddhist influences. Hindu, Hinduism, Buddhism, these are Avaita Zara. Uh, there are Lashainas that are taken from Avaita Zara and the like. Uh, of course, for a Jew to be involved in Avaita Zara is one of the greatest Averis, maybe the greatest Avera in the Torah. And yet, most poskim do say that yoga can be kosherized in the sense that you could take the relaxation elements, uh, you can take the, um, even the exercise elements, whatever it would be, and you can separate it from its religious foundations, and you can even combine it with Jewish reflections and mantras and the like. So some have said that's perfectly okay. And the same thing with alternative medicine. There are others who are stricter, who actually say that things that have their origin in idolatry have to be rejected. So this is a live machlokas on a lot of things. It involves uh, music, it involves the yoga, alternative medicine, and as I say, the, the shitas go in different, different directions here. Yeah. Um. I realize this is like a very complicated area of halacha, but I was just wondering about some, if you could give us some basics um, about, and you know, kind of places to start in terms of Hilchus Borer. Yeah, Hilchus Borer. Borer is a, a complicated halacha. By the way, I saw a wonderful, wonderful wall poster advertisement, if you notice them. Uh, there's a campaign in Yerushalayim to encourage people to learn Hilchus Shabbos. They have a program and a curriculum, and you know, maybe you've seen it. Sign like, you know, to learn Hilcha Shabbos every week and the like. And they quote Rav Yainis and Apshitz, who says that if you do not know Hilcha Shabbos very well, it is impossible that you will not be Machal Shabbos many times every Shabbos. So they put up a sign in big print where a guy says, I have not learned Hilcha Shabbos. And I have not transgressed any of the 39 malachas, like a defiant statement. Then he put right under it in small print, but it was Monday. Uh, in other words, I did not transgress Bishel, Borer, Kosev, because it was Yom Sheni. On Shabbos Kodesh was a different story, right? That's the idea. That, uh, so, Baruch Hashem, the good thing about it is that even if you're in Amor, it's in Hilcha Shabbos, but for six out of the seven days of the week, you're perfectly compliant. You're not over on Chilol Shabbos. But when it's Shabbos, you know, you're going to be in trouble. So one of the most complicated malachos actually is Borer. Borer, uh, because Borer has many, 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 many applications beyond the obvious. Borer is the prohibition of taking something bad that you don't want from something good. Uh, and it uh, comes up with food. It comes up with psvarim. It comes up with clothing. It comes up with cutlery, you know, forks, knives, spoons. It comes up with dishes. Uh, it comes up with card games, if you're playing card game on Shabbos, and the like. So borer is a malacha that can permeate. It comes up with using water filters, you know, things that uh, on your sink. So borer is extremely complicated, and there are many, many details, and there are many, many different opinions. And it's very easy to accidentally transgress Borer, not even realizing that there was a potential Borer problem. So it's one of those things that you do have to learn a lot about. I mean, if you're simply uh, asking me, uh, I, I can't really go over the Pratim here, but I will tell you that um, uh, the Art Scroll books from Rav Cohen in Lakewood uh, on, on Shabbos, the, the volume here is called The Shabbos Kitchen. The Shabbos Kitchen has a very good uh, treatment of the laws of Borer. And then you have the standard books, the Shmir Shabbos Kilchasa, which is available, of course, both in Hebrew and in English. Shmir Kilchasa, Orchos Shabbos. You know, whatever your go-to safer for Hilcha Shabbos would be, uh, I would look at Borer. But, but it could be that Rabbi Cohen's safer might be a good, a good beginning. Yeah. Here's a sentence. Why did Hashem decree that there should be a time of revelation and then Hester Panim? Why not lechatchila have revelation and live like that forever? It makes sense if sin would remove that time of revelation, but why was it prophesized to be removed? Yeah, the concept is the question is uh, why does God? Why did God create a world, a world system, 
where there is revelation, openness, miracles, to then be followed by concealment uh, and the like. And uh, sometimes that is a result of sin, so that's understandable. But other times it seems to be part of Hashem's original plan that there will be a part of world history where his presence is very, very perceptible. And then there'll be a lot of world history where he is shrouded and hidden and we don't necessarily live in that miraculous, miraculous way. I mean, again, it, it is a good question. Uh, the standard answer that's given, although I admit there are some problems with it, is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to facilitate the idea of Bechira, of free will. Meaning, if you lived in a world of constant, miraculous revelation of God, at that point you wouldn't be in a position where you would have free will that much because God's presence is very, very obvious. So Hashem established his presence. That way, it's not a blind leap of faith, but he becomes mysterious enough that you can have doubts and you can have questions, and then you have to exercise your free will. That is the standard answer, that Hester Panim uh, can be a punishment for sin, that's true, but it can also be a facilitator, a facilitation of Bechira, of free will. The big question, again, I'll be honest with you, the big question on that is that you actually see from the Chumash itself that even when HaKadosh Baruch Hu's presence was open, there were plenty of Averis that we did. I mean, consider the Chet Ego and Korach and, and the Miraglim. I mean, that was in the Dor HaMidbor uh, to a generation that saw Mitzrayim. So to make the argument that you need Hester Panim in order for there to be Bechira uh, seems incorrect because we find that there was the struggle of Bechira even at the very beginning. So I don't have a, a better answer, but, but the standard answer is Hester Panim is a facilitation of Bechira. Mm -hmm. And as the Ramban says, the Ramban says it almost with annoyance. Uh, it's almost as if somebody was bothering the Ramban. Why doesn't God do miracles today? The Ramban says, why does God have to go to the trouble of establishing himself over and over and over again. He did it already. He did it already, that should be good enough. He doesn't have to do it every day. Now, the opposite way of looking at it is, he still does it every day. That his maintenance of the world, the universe, is miraculous. The Ramban actually writes elsewhere that there really is no difference between miracle and nature. The only difference between miracle and nature is frequency. If it happens every day, we call it nature. If it happens once every 10,000 years, we call it miracle. But the miracle of the world going on, right? The sun rising, the, uh, the sun setting, the earth spinning, the ability of life to, to breathe and, and, and to reproduce, these are miracles that happen every day. We just take them for granted because they're so common. In fact, the Ramban even says, the word for miracle is nes. Nes actually means a banner, a flag. Meaning, when Hashem sees that we're taking things for granted, He'll give us a red flag just to show us that He's around. But in reality, nature itself is a, is a miracle. And, and indeed, is this not explicit in the Shemona Esrei? In Modim, we say, Al Nisecha Shebechal Yom Imanu for the miracles that you give us every single day. Hi. Shalom Aleichem, how are you? Um, I hope you will need Modim. By the way, the, the, the Ramban, I think that was the one you were talking about at the end of Parshas Bo. Yes. That was a real eye-opener. Real That's correct, yeah. The, uh, the question that I have is about uh, Gemara and the nature of disagreement when we have, a, a, looking just as an example, at Sukkah 30a, where I think it was uh, Rabbi Yitzhak Bar Nachmani, he says, in the name Amar Shmuel. So he's saying in the name of, of another rabbi who brings a, a case, and then it says Masid afterwards, and there's a disagreement. But the person lists the disagreement as disagreeing with Rabbi Yitzhak. So wouldn't it be that because he's saying it over in the name of somebody else that he's disagreeing with the original person, 
And in this case, he does specifically mention who he's disagreeing with. But is there a system in the Gemara for how we understand who he's disagreeing with? Well, well, uh, it's a little complicated because obviously um, if a rabbi says something in the name of an original source and another rabbi argues with him and he doesn't say that the original source said something different, then by implication he is arguing with the original source. But he may not be talking to the original source. The original source might be dead. So an example would be, let's imagine that you said something in the base Medrash in the name of a rabbi who died last year. And let's assume that I consider that statement very problematical. So I will be talking to you by saying, I think that this statement is wrong. Although I would actually be saying that the rabbi was wrong. But you see what I'm saying? In other words, if you look at these questions and answers as part of an actual discussion, that was taking place, then you're not necessarily, the questioner is not necessarily talking to the original rabbi who may have been long gone, been long dead at the time. So that's why often in the Shaklavataria, it's the immediate speakers who are talking to each other, even though their arguments are reflecting back to an earlier, earlier speaker. Are there instances of somebody going back on? Uh, yeah, yeah, th there are instances. I mean, it's, it's hard to know, but it would depend on whether the person is alive, is the person present, you know, etc. cetera. Uh, but it all depends on how these things work. And by the way, you also need to know that it's very, very interesting how much of the Gemara is in the nature of a transcript and how much of the Gemara is in the nature of an editorial joining of things. So, for example, a lot of Gemaras read as if they are actual discussions that are going on, meaning Rabbi so-and-so says this, I ask the question, you know, etc. somebody gives an answer. So you actually have a snapshot or a video, whatever it is, of a group of people in a base medrash discussing a problem. Other times, uh, this was all done by the final editors of the Gemara, Ravina and Ravashi, in which... Somebody said it then, it may have been 200 years before, and Ravashi brings in, without mentioning his own name, that this is contradicted by so-and-so. And then when it gives an answer, this is fascinating, the answer is not always, was not always said as an answer to this question. Rather, Ravina and Ravashi took statements of other rabbis that were made as independent statements and utilize them as answers to the question. So it's often going to be the case that an Amora's answer to the question was not an Amora answering the question. It was Ravina and Ravashi using the statement of the Amora to answer a question. The statement of the Amora was not even connected to that question necessarily. So it's very, very fascinating that when you have the flow of question, answer, question, answer. It's not always clear, is this an actual discussion of question, answer, or are various statements being used as answers, but the statements themselves were not made in that, in that connection. Yeah. Is, is, is it true that you deny that Yeah, so the question is, is it true that every Tana and Amora uh, was able to uh, resurrect the dead? And if it is true, why is that such a great praise of God if, if a bunch of people could do it? So it is recorded in some sources, not in Chazal, but in some later sources. It is recorded that every Tana and Amora that's mentioned in Shas had the koach of Tachiyah Samesim. I, I would not call that an article of faith, and I wouldn't say you have to believe such a thing because Chazal themselves did not testify uh, to that. Uh, and it could even be that the Sfarim that did say it was in the nature of a little bit of a guzma to try to tell you the koach, the greatness of, 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 of Chazal. Um, now, the question, your second question is, if we do assume that hundreds and hundreds of people, these were, were able to resurrect the dead, then it no longer becomes uh, such a great achievement 
of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, uh, because a lot of people could do it. Well, uh, that's a good question, that, which is why, thank you, which is why I have a little bit of a feeling that, in fact, it may, be, it may have been a guzma. Now, we do have one instance, and even that can be interpreted, of a tchiyas samesim. Uh, this is a very, very famous Gemara. When the Gemara says a person should drink on Purim, chayav adam levsumei b'poria, until they don't know the difference between Oror Haman and Baruch Mordechai. Remember, everyone knows that Gemara. Right, so that's one of the mitzvahs that people are very careful to keep, uh, Mahadrin, all of the Chumras, and the like. So what does the Gemara say right afterwards? That Rabbi Zeira was a guest at Rabbah's house. And Rabbah slit Rabbi Zeira's throat. He was drunk. He slit his throat. And Rabbi Zeira was dead. That's what it seems to say. And Rabbah prayed that Rabbi Zeira should be resurrected. And Rabbi Zeira was resurrected. And then Rabbah invited him over for next year for Purim. And Rabbi Zeira said, you know, I can't assume that a miracle will happen every, every year. So I turned down the invitation. So there you have one specific instance of apparently Tchiyas HaMesim. But even then, even then, Meforshim say, it was Lav Dafka Tchiyas HaMesim. It means that uh, Rabbi Zeira was very, very close to death and, and Rabbi's prayers brought him back. In other words, not, not in a literal sense, uh, Tchiyas HaMesim itself. So I don't think there's any clear makor uh, that a Tana or a Mar had a Kayach of Tchiyas HaMesim. And it seems unlikely because the Gemara itself says, the Gemara says in Tainus, that there are certain keys that God only does not give to even a malach, that God himself holds on to. And one of those keys is, indeed, techiyas ha-mesim. Techiyas ha-mesim is not nimsar uh, to a malach. Now, let's go back to Nach for a moment. Uh, what about Elio Hanavi? And what about Elisha? Right? Both of them seemingly revived the dead. So the Gemara in Tainus actually says this was an exception. Elio and Elisha were exceptions from the rule, implying that they were the only exceptions for the rule. I have to say the Abarbanel actually says even in those cases it was a deep coma. It was not uh, clinical, clinical death. The Abarbanel, even in those cases, interprets it in a non-literal way. So I don't think there's any, any hechrich. Uh, the Gemara does say, though, that the Tanoim and Amoraim, many of them, not all, we don't know about all of them, were able to create life through Sefer Yitzira. They used the Kabbalistic book, Sefer Yitzira. They created a calf that they would shech the Chavit Shabbos and they would eat. Uh, they created animal life through Sefer Yitzira. You can get Sefer Yitzira yourself. You can get it in English. Ari Kaplan translated Sefer Yitzira. So you could try to do this. And uh, a, human, a humanoid, the golem, they call it, could be created by Sefer Yitzira as well. And if Yaakov Emden has a whole shaila, can a man that is created by Sefer Yitzira be counted for a minion? Right? So let's say you're in a shul, right? Baruch uh, Hashem, in Yerushalayim, we tend not to, you know, we always have a minion, but uh, there are shuls that it's hard to get a minion. So if you have nine people, can you just make a quickie, uh, quickie Sefer Yitzira guy, Gailam, and count him for a, a minion? And some people want to apply that to clone, a cloned person, but there's, there's no dimmion. A clone is very, very different. A clone has internal organs and is born from a woman. A clone is born from a human mother. So a clone is vada human, uh, even if a gailam would not be halakhically human. Yeah? Yochid Barabba and today, how does it apply today? For instance, if somebody has a, uh, somebody has a rock, and his rock is passing in the and everybody's against it, but this is his rock, this is my rock. What is he supposed to do? He's supposed to do what his rock says, or what, how, what the rabbin argue with him? And also, Yochid Barabba and Yochid Barabba, if there's, let's say, a punch in the dark, let's say, yeah, yeah, so that, that, that's a, those are very, very good questions. So, so the, the shach, I think, gives us the uh, key to all of this. He says, Yochid v'rab malacha karabim has two different meanings. It's one, one phrase, but it has two different meanings. And how it applies depends on what meaning you're using. The first meaning is within a Sanhedrin, within a single centralized body that is voting on an issue. Bechihai gavne, 
the halacha is like the rabbim keneged the yachid, and you're not allowed to follow the das of the yachid, and even the yachid is not allowed to follow his own psak, uh, even if he's the gadol hador. That was the story of the gemara in Bava Metzia by Rabbi Elazar ben Horkinus, who was the gadol hador. He did not want to accept the decision of the Sanhedrin. He even had a bas kol from Hashem saying he was right. Bechiai gavna. Uh, the answer was, Loba Shemaimi, the Torah is not in heaven, you got to follow the right. So that's a real, we call that a real Yochid Varab Malacha Karabim, the Das Yochid is Nitcha. But, says the Shach, when the Chachamim are not sitting in a single body and debating, it's simply more Chachamim say this way, more Chachamim say this way, the Dairaisa Dikadin of Yochid Varabim you don't have. So, here's the Knech. So if I'm a person, who has not reached the level of psak, And I don't have a Rebbe that reached that level of psak. so b'chi agavna, I should follow the Rabbim even then. But, if I'm a yochid shihigi alahira, or I have a Rebbe that is a yochid shihigi alahira, they are not mechoyev to follow the shita of Raif Paiskin, even to be meiko, they could be meiko, because since they weren't sitting b'maisha of echot, uh, you don't have the Dairais and Dekadin of Yochid Varam, which explains, exa- I mean, this is exactly why, let's say, Revol Yashiv could paskin, Keneged, most of, I mean, I, I'm not sure how often he did it, but he could paskin theoretically, Keneged, most of the post or because he's Higiel Lahira, he has the right to paskin, Keneged, Keneged, Keneged people. The Gra did it all the time. Okay, the Gra, of course, was unusual, but the Gra did it all the time. And by the way, the Gra, Bidafka, didn't make a claim that he was special. I mean, the, the, Gra, the Gra articulates that a yochet shigil l'hayra could be chay like an anray paiskim. So, basically, the idea that people say, oh, you got to do this because rayf paiskim, that's primarily for people who are not higil l'hayra. In other words, as an amaretz, I have to, you know, I, have, I should follow rayf paiskim. But you can't say to Rav Moshe Feinstein, oh, how can you paskim this way, rov paiskim, <laughs> Okay, Ramosha wasn't on enough. I'm not sure how he would answer it, but the answer would be, okay, Rov Poskim, you know, uh, I'm not m'chayiv to follow Rov Poskim. So there are two different halachas in Yochid Verabim. Yeah. Here's another sentence. In America, it's very common to make a fixed minion in someone's house. If a shul is within reasonable walking distance, should we daven in such places? What other halachas should we know about such minions? For example... Sometimes the setup is folding chairs in the living room, but sometimes it's in a garage or basement, and it might look like a real synagogue. Is there a halakhic difference? Yeah, this is actually a very, very excellent question, and it comes up in the States. It comes up a lot. Uh, and that is people want to make uh, kind of ad hoc minyanim uh, in their homes. Now, this can take two forms, and depending on the form, they'll be very, very different. Sometimes it's really the start of a new show. We want to make a new show. Now that's a separate shayla. When are you permitted to break away from an established show to make a new show? I mean, that itself is an interesting question. Uh, one might say, well, hopefully your motives will be kosher motives, l'shem shamayim. We want to have a slower davening and more learning. Sometimes it's the opposite. We want to have a faster davening and less learning. <laughs> you know, sometimes the motives are not good. Sometimes the motives are good. Uh, but then you also have to look at uh, the impact of an existing show that you shouldn't really start your own minyanim if that's going, going to undermine uh, the existing kahila structure. But that's one type of problem. That, that's an issue of starting a new show. Now, the thing that I think the questioner is asking about is not the idea of starting a new show, but often people don't like to walk uh, far uh, for Friday night or Shabbos Mincha, meaning they're going to go to their regular show Shabbos morning. That'll be the big service for two or three hours uh, or whatever. But Friday night, you know, a lot of people live in this neighborhood. Why don't we just come to my house and uh, we'll dive in uh, Kabbalah's Shabbos or Shabbos Mincha. Let's do that instead of walking over. So that's a different situation. That's not trying to start a new show. That's simply creating... In fact, those are not, I mean, it's only convenience. They're basically convenience setups. So that's really a different issue. Some people, uh, some postkim feel that convenience minyanim are not really proper. 
because the halacha is that a person should daven in a base knesses, meaning there are two reasons why you go to shul, two diff- and there are two different reasons. One reason is there's a mitzvah to daven with a minion called tefillah b'tzibor. The other reason is there's a mitzvah to daven in a base knesses. In fact, do you know that even if you're davening b'yechidus is a mitzvah to come to shul and daven because this is a makam kadosh, the shechina is here, and the like. So when you have an ad hoc convenience minion, uh, you're lacking Kedusha space Knesses, even though you have a minion, so it's tefillah, so it's tefillah b'tzibor. So um, I, I would say, at a, that's one thing to think about, but, but I would say at a minimum, they should get rishus of the Rav, meaning if they're not establishing a new shul and they are still under the rishus of the main shul, they should not do it without uh, the, the consent of the Rav. And very often it is done without the consent. And they, I mean, they don't tell the Rav, I mean, although he usually finds out uh, one, way, one way or the other. Uh, yeah. So I was wondering, um, what would the, the Rav tell a man that is serious about getting married? What are the qualities that uh, one should uh, strive to embody to get married for, for, for marriage? How does, how, does the man how does a man know that he's ready for marriage or what should... Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing I can tell you, Baruch Hashem, uh, I've been married for um, 43 years, and um, I'm still I'm still learning them. You know, so it's not <laughs> it's not like you ever have a definitive uh, answer. Uh, but the truth is, uh, the single most important quality, basically, uh, is the willingness to be makar tov, to be a grateful person, to appreciate what people do for you, and the, abil- and the willingness to sacrifice some of your own convenience to help another person. Uh, because when a person gets married, a person is taking on the responsibility of another life, uh, first his wife and then his children and the like. And if a person is uh, fixed with his ego, with his gratification, uh, with his conveniences, with whatever is best for him, looking after number one, that's a recipe for failure. That, that will not enable him to have a successful marriage. So what you strive to do is you strive to become a compassionate person, a kind person, a grateful person, a helpful person. And uh, on the negative side, you try to work on things like anger, try to you know, get over that. And, um, you know, what can I say? I mean, other than that, uh, the process of becoming a better person will make you a better husband. Uh, Meaning, there's not necessarily a specific marriage quality that you're looking for. Uh, You're really looking for the midos that make you a better person. And as you become a better person, you will be a better better husband. And that's why in many ways, you know, yeshiva can be a little bit of a laboratory for it. Uh, you know, how do you deal with roommates, right? How do you deal with uh, all the different situations of living together in tight quarters uh, and, and the like? How do you handle frustration? How do you handle uh, people who make messes or, or, or whatever it is? And uh, this is kind of a laboratory for kind of going, getting through conflict and getting through difficulties. And even though it may be very, very frustrating, this is really a preparatory ground for dealing with the bigger issues that a person is going to face as a husband and as a, uh, as a parent, you know, hopefully. So that's all I would say, you know, um, was it? Uh, my wife told me that she once, uh, before we were married, she was talking to a Hasidic Rebetzin. And uh, she kept on asking him, like, uh, how do you get... I, mean, we, I don't know even if we knew each other this before we, we met. She said, how do you get a good husband? So she said, you get a good husband by being a good wife. Uh, and the man asked a question, how do you get a good wife? By being a good husband. <laughs> Meaning to say, uh, you get what you are, basically. And the more you work on yourself, then the more I can will give you the thing that's right for you. Yeah. There's another sign there. Why does the Judaism go through the mom and the tribe go through the dad? Other religions claim the religion comes through the father. Um, and there's an answer to this, I guess, that it, uh, it's guaranteed to know who a child's mother is. 
And then there's also that uh, when Egyptians would rape women in, in Egypt, uh, they made it so that like the, so that that reason is that the, they knew that the child came from the mom, but they weren't sure about the dad. So the child Jewish it became the mom. So anyway, is there a but, but in general is there a more spiritual understanding to that? Yeah. So this is an excellent question. Everyone knows that halachically, although there were different opinions on this, halachically Judaism is called matrilineal, which basically means if mother is Jewish, you are Jewish, even if your father is not Jewish. Although, by the way, there is one opinion of Tysus and Kedushin that says a person with a non-Jewish father must convert. There is such a shita in Tysus. It's not unheard of, but Lamaisa, we don't pass him that way, and we don't do that, so nobody should get upset. Uh, uh, so basically, Judaism is matrilineal, but tribal affiliation, just repeating the question, is patrilineal. Right? That, that's a funny thing. I'm a Kohen if my father is a Kohen, I'm not a Kohen if my mother is a Bas Kohen. My tribe is defined by my father, but my Judaism is defined by my mother. A little strange. So first of all, let me point out an interesting Ramban. The Ramban actually says that before Matan Torah, before Matan Torah, even the Jewish religion was based on the father. There was a change at Matan Torah where the definition of what made you a Jew changed. So the Reform Movement has a partial <laughs> truth. Right? The Reform Movement likes to say when they adopted, well now they have either parent, but, but originally they wanted to go with the father, patrilineal descent. They said, oh, matril matrilineal descent is a change in Jewish law. And it was not the original Jewish law. Well, they're actually right. It changed at Mount Sinai. It's pretty old. Uh, it changed at Matan Torah. But they are correct that prior to, prior to Matan Torah, uh, even Jewish identity was patrilineal. In fact, the Ramban offers a beautiful shot. If you remember, uh, the Torah gives us the story of the blasphemer. He was the person who was the son of an Egyptian father and a Jewish mother, and he cursed God. And Moshe didn't know what the halacha was, and he had to ask Hashem. And Hashem said, if a person curses God, he is stoned to death. So people have a question. I mean, this is a question on a lot of things. How could Moshe not know? Didn't Moshe get the Torah at Sinai? If Moshe got the mitzvahs at Sinai, Moshe got the commandments that blasphemers get stoned. What, what does it mean he did? Of course, this, this, is, this is a question about other things too. Pesach Sheni, B'no Slavchat. No, the, but the basic question is, how could Moshe not know if he, if he himself got the whole Torah at Sinai? So at least in this case, the Ramban offers a Gavaldiga interpretation. Blasphemy is both a crime under Torah law and it's a crime under the Sheva Mitzvos B'nai Noach for a guy. But the punishments are different. A Jew who blasphemes gets stoning. A guy who blasphemes, like all the Bnei Noach, gets uh, hereg, decapitation. So now, says the Ramban, Moshe knows the halacha. Moshe knows that a Jew who blasphemes gets stoning. That was given to him at Sinai. But Moshe is not sure how to grandfather people in. Because before Matan Torah, this guy would be a Jew. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, this guy would be a guy, A guy because his father was uh, a Mitzri. After Matan Torah, he would be a Jew. But does that apply to people who already were born or only applies to new people? So Moshe Rabbeinu's suffix was, do I don him like a guy, or do I don him like a Jew? Okay, so step number one is, therefore, matrilineal descent is a product of Matan Torah. That's step number one. Now the question is why? So again, uh, as the questioner indicated, uh, one of the reasons that's often given uh, is that maternity uh, can be established for a certainty, paternity cannot, particularly in societies where uh, women were promiscuous or raped by multiple people, and therefore you never knew who the father was. Uh, now even though today they have DNA and the like, but the Torah was given on the assumption that you didn't have all of these testing. Uh, now the question is, is there a more spiritual reason? There actually is. And this is based on the Gemara in Nida. 
that says that before a child is born, there is a malach that teaches the child all of the Torah in the womb of the mother. And then when the child is born, the malach hits the... Uh, well, first of all, the, 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 the neshama of the baby makes an oath to God. This is the beginning of the famous work, Tanya. That's why it's called Tanya. Tanya, we have a brisa in Maseches Nida that says, Mashbian Oso. They make the baby swear to be a tzaddik and not to be a Russia. Right? The baby kind of takes an oath of office. I will try to live my life in accordance with the will of God. And then the baby's born and the baby is hit on the lip and the baby forgets all the Torah and he's into the world. Now, Stamaza, you may ask the question, what's the purpose of the baby learning the whole Torah if the baby is born not knowing it? The baby is born forgetting it. The answer is that the Torah is imprinted on his spiritual essence. So even if the brain doesn't know it, the spiritual message of the Torah is engraved in his neshama. And that's why when he eventually encounters the Torah, there will be a sense that this sounds familiar. Been here before. There's going to be a shock of deja vu or some type of recognition. Now, based on that idea, it would appear, and maybe that's why it's connected to Matan Torah, that the spiritual personality of the child is formed in the mother's womb by this malach. And therefore, that defines his very, very nature. Now, the question you'll then ask me is, OK, so what about a gear? What about a person with a non-Jewish mother and either a Jewish father or a non-Jewish father? It makes no difference, right? So did that gear, who was a guy when he was uh, in utero, did he have some malach teaching him? What exactly, what exactly happened? It's an interesting question, right? I mean, Lechayra, he was not in the womb of a Jewish woman. So what spiritual influences did he have? So again, the, the, the Svarim HaKadoshim tell us that Enochinami, <coughs> perhaps he didn't have that particular influence, but either going to the mikvah gives it to him. So it's kind of a speed course. <laughs> it's going to the mikvah, okay, gives him all of that. <coughs> or there is an idea that his neshama was present. There actually is a teaching based on the Zohar that, you know, Hashem, remember Hashem offered the Torah to all the nations of the world and they turned it down. But in every nation that turned down the Torah, there was a minority of that nation that wanted to accept it. So what happens to that minority? 10%, 15%, 20%, whatever it was. Those are the neshamas who eventually become gerim. That their, their neshamas, at least their ancestors' neshamas, were at Har Sinai absorbing the Torah from that vantage point. But be it as it may, I think the malach learning with the, uh, with the fetus is why uh, matrilineal, matrilineal descent is, is very critical in Jewish identity. Yeah. Um, so there seems to be a, a steer in uh, in understanding in Brachot regarding Erva. Uh, there's a discussion about uh, is is a do, do Goyim have Erva? And the there's a Havamina that they don't have Erva, um, which implies that Erva is just a Zeradakatu. And then uh, later on, we're talking about uh, Kolisha, and it, it has a Pasuk, but the Pasuk can only be understood through Erva being a uh, uh, in Metzia. Like, uh, it's Erva, as explained by Rashi, is something that is like uh, you have a Chuka for her. Um, and if you'll say that that's just a, uh, that like, okay, it still has a Pasuk, even though the Pasuk doesn't mention Erva, or whatever I've heard in your in uh, shiur that you gave that like there's some focus about sh uh, shok is erva shokisha is erva and some say that it's it's the calf and that's why like people wear wear uh, or women wear uh, tights 
um, their leggings. Um, but it um, that that would only be uh, an eitz. That would only help if if uh, if erva if erva is a gzeret akat. It would. Yeah. Sorry. You you said that. Tights wouldn't help if the calf were if the calf was if the erba, calf was there, but tights wouldn't help. Was yeah. erba, tights wouldn't help. That's correct. But, yeah. it, um, but that that would only be true if erba is uh, in mitzvah and not in uh, and not a gzeret Yeah. Um, well. Erba? Yeah. Yeah. So let me just explain this a little bit. Um, this is a very important set of halachas that uh, not everybody is aware of. Uh, all of us know it's neas, women have to dress a certain way, but, but one has to understand there are certain consequences for a man that when I am facing a woman who is not in compliance with the laws of tzniyas, I'm on a bus, I'm on a train, I'm on a Shabbos table, and the woman is not uh, dressed properly, sleeves are short or, or whatever, whatever it would be, I am disabled, I am not allowed to learn Torah I'm not allowed to say brachos. I'm not allowed to daven unless I turn my face away or b'dievet, you can close your eyes or maybe look down into a sitter. Uh, and that's a din of erva, meaning erva prohibits the recitation of what is called devarim shebiktush. Now note the word recitation. I am allowed to think about Torah. So if I'm sitting on a train and I'm facing non sanua women, I can think about the I'm not allowed to say the words. I don't say brachos, I don't uh, daven and the like. Uh, now, there's a famous, famous, famous machlokas, the Mishnah Brewer and the Orach HaShulchan. How far do you take that? You know, a married woman has a special halacha of nakedness that no one, single women don't have, and that is she's muchayavis to keep her hair covered. Right, a single girl does not have to cover her hair, obviously. So the question is, if I have a married woman whose uh, hair is uncovered, uh, but otherwise she's dressed sanua, am I allowed to daven, right? So the, the Mishnah Burra says no, because for a married woman, uncovered hair is an erva, right? For a married woman, uncovered hair is like a single woman wearing a short skirt. That's what the Mishnah Burra says. The Yorach HaShulchan has a big, big chiddish that since Bizman Hazeh, uncovered hair is not so sexually stimulating. The Yorach HaShulchan says, it does not prohibit amiras devarim shebikdusha. Now, in the modern Orthodox community, the Yorach HaShulchan will often be misquoted. And it's important to know that it's a misquote. They will say, oh, the Yorach HaShulchan says, since hair is not so sexually stimulating today, a married woman does not have to cover her hair. Wrong, wrong, wrong. The Yorach HaShulchan absolutely does not matter a married woman not to cover her hair. In fact, he says, harabim, it's just, rather, he's simply saying, if a married woman in violation of halacha does not cover her hair, it does not have the secondary effect of prohibiting amiras devarim shebiktusha. The Mishnah Brura is cholek on that. And again, Rav Moshe Feinstein writes in a tshuva, that he had tremendous. Rav Moshe Feinstein uh, used very few achreinim, um, but he had a great, uh, he admired the Aruch HaShulchan a lot, and he said that although he thinks a ben Torah should be machmir, but he says he can't, uh, certainly he can't argue with the Aruch HaShulchan, kvar uh, haira zakein, the elder has already paskened uh, that it's going to, that it's going to be, uh, going to be mutter. So this is something that uh, even from people don't always realize. And by the way, let me point out that this halacha of Amir Estorosha even applies to your own wife, to your own wife. In other words, in other words, uh, in your household itself, you're the only one home, you're home with your wife. Technically speaking, again, again this is an interesting Hashkafa question, but technically speaking, uh, your, you know, your wife with you, she can have short sleeves, etc. Uh, meaning she's not muchuyeves in the laws of tzniyas, and we also paskin that at least miikar adin, she doesn't have to have her hair covered, and all of that is fine. But you still can't do tevarim shabikdusha under those environments. So keep in mind that these rules about tevarim shabikdusha are not only about another woman. 
they apply to your wife, they apply to your daughters above a certain age, you know. It's a separate halacha. Kolish is the same thing. Kolish is the same too. There, there's, halacha number one says, I'm not allowed to listen to a woman sing. So that doesn't apply to my wife, that doesn't apply to my daughter. But halacha number two says, that because it has a din of erva, I'm not supposed to say brachos, that does apply even to my wife, which raises a whole bunch of questions. How can I sing benching with my wife? Uh, Etc. Okay, again, for Zemiras, they're different. Hetera, maybe we'll deal with that another time. But okay, but this is a long digression. But, but the question is this um, Is erva, I'm just going to open, I'm just coming back to your question. Is erva a technical rule or is erva a hearhor based rule? By that I mean to say, is it simply if something is classified as erva? you have an Isser of Dvorim Shebekdusha? Or is the problem that it's sexually stimulating and arousing? Meaning the halacha is not based on the abstraction of erva, but it's based on the effect, effect, that it has on your mind or your kavana or your thoughts. Now the Arach HaShulchan, from the fact that the Arach HaShulchan matters the uncovered hair of the married woman today, he seems to be clearly going with the idea that erva is based on hirhor. And that's why he says there's no hirhor today. Uh, the other poskim either argue with that and they objectify it, or they claim that there could be hirhor even today. It's not clear exactly what basis <coughs> they argue with the Aruch HaShulchan. So the question that you're raising is that if there is a discussion whether the laws of erva would apply to a non-Jewish woman who's not dressed properly, that only makes sense if erva is some type of technical construct, and then we can argue, a Jew, non-Jew, etc. Uh, if it's based on hirhor, improper sexual thought, then obviously there can be no distinction between a Jew and a non-Jew. It's the same, same problem. That's a very good point. All I can tell you is, since la halacha, at least, we paskin, that these laws of erva do apply to a non-Jew, vis-a-vis amiras tvarim shepikdusha, so in the halachic maskana, we could still have that question. Meaning, you're correct, if you took the other position, clearly you'd be looking at it as an objective category. But Lamaisa, we don't follow that, that other position. Yeah. Um, are the different cars on a train considered separate rooms, or are they all considered part of one room, which is just the whole, the entire vehicle, which is the train? I guess it would be even nice if a person would die in one of the cars, bless yourself, bless yourself. there'd be a coin in a different car, would already be... Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, it, it happens, uh, you know, um, there was a famous rabbi, conser conservative, I mean, he was from, but conservative, well, wor he worked for, he worked for JTS, Rav Shaul Lieberman, who was a... Uh, it's a story for another time. A big, big Talmud Chacham who learned in Slobodka, but his Parnassah was teaching in the Jewish Theological Seminary, and uh, he wrote uh, major, major works on the Yushalmi and the Tesefta. Uh, but what happened? He happened to die, a flight to Israel. Imagine that you're, you're going to Israel, just die in your seat, you know. <laughs> right? you're the, you know the guy sitting next to you is dead. A little shakes you up a little bit. But okay. Um, so the halach is very, very clear that different uh, cars on a train are different houses. And because they're different houses, the tuma of one car will not pass to the other car. But, 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 as soon as a door is opened, let's assume that right, the tuma is going to pass. Because the way tuma works is, if you have two different houses, two different uh, even rooms or two different houses, and there's an opening that's only a tefach by a tefach, very small opening. The tuma goes from one chamber into another chamber. So it would be very, very easy for the tuma to spread. But as long as the doorways are kept uh, closed, uh, the tuma will not uh, pass out. Yeah? Um, a couple of Meister stuff and questions. Um, number one, if I donate by a credit card, one of these online platforms or any yeah, method really. Yeah. So obviously the credit card company takes a fee, the platform might take a fee, the cause is not getting the full amount. So number one, am I able to count it as money so that I gave that full donation amount? 
And number two, if not, I, I have no way of knowing how much exactly the fees were. So what am I supposed to do on my, on my husband? Um, and then I have, is it okay, a second different micro question. Um, I heard a whole lot of that if someone gives you, a, or you give someone else, you know, a physical item, like a couch or something, or even cash designated for that specific item, it would not, they would not be shy to take out my sir. I don't know if that's true or not, but I was wondering about a gift card, because it's, it's not as liquid as cash, but it's not as specific as an item. Yeah, yeah, those are two good questions. Uh, the first question is, when you make a donation via credit card, so you give $100, that should go to a yeshiva, go to a tzedakah, the yeshiva does not get $100, uh, because uh, the platform that, through which you're donating takes something, and the credit card company takes something. I mean, typically, um, I believe it's, it's around 2%, uh, so, in fact, that's why there are some small businesses that don't want to take credit cards. Why, why not? Because they lose uh, that 2%, and uh, even though, you know, the cheshmer normally is, well, if I take credit cards, maybe I'll get so much extra business that it's, it's kadai for me to lose the 2%. Some businesses say, no, I don't want to lose my 2%, and therefore I will only do business by cash. Also, but although cash businesses also have an uh, easier way of avoiding sales tax and VATs and, and, and everything else. So the question becomes, uh, if I give $100 to Tzedakah, but the Tzedakah only gets 98 or $97, can I take the $100 deduction against my MISER obligation, right? I, I earned $1,000. I owe $100 of Tzedakah. Uh, can I take the whole $100 as a credit to my Meister obligation. It's a good question. I think the analogy, I think, would be this. The analogy, I think you could, and the analogy would be uh, every time you give something to a fundraiser. Uh, Meshulachim go around collecting for charity, for yeshivas, right? The yeshivas have designated representatives. Meshulachim get paid by commission. They get a percentage of what they collect. Sometimes the percentages are quite, quite high. We're not talking about 2% or 3%. The percentages might be 49%. In fact, uh, there's a psak that a mishula can get to, uh, up to a fifth, uh, as long as it's one cent less than 50%, as long as the majority goes to staka, you can have a fundraising commission as high as 49.5%. Quite amazing. Uh, most people who give money uh, to a fundraiser, don't expect that to happen. And again, that's fairly rare. The commissions are very rarely that high. But halakhically, they can be pretty high. And the answer would be this, that since the tzedakah itself has to spend this money in order to get the money, so this is part of the uh, tzedakah process. And therefore, I believe that uh, you could analogize the uh, platform and the credit cards as um, part of the necessary expenses. It's as if you're, you've given the hundred dollars to the charity, and the charity has to pay off these different these different obligations. However, it would seem to me that if you have an alternative way of uh, getting a higher percentage to the tzedakah, it would be better to give it that way. Just a matter of common sense, you want to give it in a way that maximizes the the donation. Now, the second uh, issue uh, that was raised is actually a very very important issue. And that is um, the obligation of Meiser Kasafim, right? That's the obligation that when you get money, you get income, you got to give 10% of it to Tzedakah, right? That's our general idea. So that doesn't apply to everything. Uh, it's different than taxes. Uh, it applies only to money. So if somebody gives me a gift, somebody gives me a car, right? Somebody gives me a computer, somebody gives me a kiddush cup, I'm not mechuyev to pay 10% of the value of that kiddush cup until I sell it, and then I take it 10%, and I may never sell it, but then I would take off my sir, but until it's cash, not. This is different than IRS. You know, under the IRS, you may sometimes have to pay, well, if it's a pure gift, my sir, it's not taxable, but if you win a prize, this is the big issue of people on game shows. They win cars, right? They win a free car that's worth whatever it is, $50,000, well, that's treated as fifty thousand dollars of income. They're going to have to pay, you know, uh, uh, you know, six thousand uh, dollars 
on that car, and sometimes they're going to have to sell the car to get the money to pay the taxes. So they're not really that much, that much ahead. But halachically, you don't have to pay miser on items. You only have to pay miser on cash. So once you have this distinction between item and cash, so what about things that are kind of hybrid? And a gift card is a very, very excellent example. Uh, a gift card is not cash uh, unless, well, so I would differentiate if you could cash it in, maybe it's cash, but uh, if you have to use it on Amazon or you have to use it uh, for whatever store is issuing the card, so in effect, you have a certain range of items. So are you mechoyev to give miser on 10% of the value of the gift card that you got? So really, the post can say it kind of depends how broad a base the gift card is, meaning an Amazon gift card essentially says you could buy like everything in the world almost, right? Everything in the world, uh, except they don't have houses yet, but everything is on Amazon. So an Amazon gift card is treated as cash. If, on the other hand, you have a specialty store that only sells uh, China or something, so that's like they gave you China, so you wouldn't. So it really depends on how broad-based the gift card is, but a broad-based card, it is better to give Miser, Miser on. Yeah. I was wondering, is one allowed to, to test Hashem under any circumstances or situations? And if, if so, what, are, what might those situations circumstances? Yeah, so, so the Shulchan Aruch says, based on the Gemara, that there is one area that you could test Hashem, and yet, and yet, modern postgames say you don't have that one either. <laughs> And that is giving staka. Uh, the Shulchan Aruch basically says, based on a pasuk in Malachi, that if I have economic problems and I give staka and I say that I'm giving staka because I'm sure that God is going to, you know, make me rich or make me wealthy, staka is such an assurance that you are allowed to even test Hashem. Bachanuni Nabazos, based on the Pasuk in Malachi. And that's how the Shulchan Aruch Paskins. Now, a lot of people have a question here. A lot of, in fact, people ask me this all the time. Uh, and they say, well, okay, I want to be rich. You know, can I give stucca? And say, I'm giving stucca with the expectation I'm going to be rich. So, Lemaisa, in spite of the Pesach of the Shulchan Aruch, Rav Chaim Kinevsky, Zechreinu Levracha, uh, said that you're practically not allowed to do that today. And he gave a number of different reasons. There's like interlocking reasons. One reason is that, first of all, what's the definition of being rich? In other words, uh, Chazal never said, and Malachi never said, if you give tzedakah, you're going to be Bill Gates. Rather, you're going to be okay. But most of us are already okay, meaning, meaning a middle-class life today is actually rich. I mean, the notion, in fact, even a poor person can be relatively rich. I mean, the notion of a poor person who doesn't have bread in the house, that's not so much benimsa today. I mean, uh, you know, everybody has bread, uh, you, know, you know, whatever whatever it would be. So that's one issue, the definition of being rich. A second issue, Rav Chaim says, which is a little more controversial, is that what happens sometimes is that segulos, there are segulos for wealth, but there are also negative segulos for poverty, different averis that we do. So it's true that if all you had was the positive, you would get the wealth, but you also have a countervailing negative, which means maybe the wealth you get is you're not going to be as poor as you would have been based on the averis. And as a result, practically, we, we cannot really test HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So as a practical matter, in spite of the language of the Shulchan Aruch, we do not test the Kaddish Baruch Hu because the Kaddish Baruch Hu has chashbainas that we don't always understand. The whole book of Eiv is about the idea that we don't understand the, the mechanisms, the workings of divine justice. So we accept what Hashem gives us with simcha and with, uh, and with faith. You know, I, I don't remember if it's Rav Zosalantra or the Kutzke Rebbe, but there is, there is such a, a statement of a great person that the first rule of the Torah is not to be foolish. Uh, I'll try to check uh, who exactly said that. 
it sounds more like the Katsu Rebbe, but, but it could be Rabbi Saul said it as well. Uh, and the meaning of it is that piety, sitkus, righteousness, needs to be balanced with a sense of a common sense as well. And sometimes a person thinks they're doing a pious, righteous act, when in fact, if they think about it a little bit in a simple way, they would see that what they think is constructive is actually destructive. So just a few examples. The example the Gemara itself gives is of the chassid shota. The chassid shota means the idiotic, pious man where a woman is drowning in the ocean. And the man who's a good swimmer says, I can't rescue her because I'm not supposed to touch a woman. So he thinks he's doing such a righteous thing. He's an idiot. He's a fool because pikuach uh, nefesh would tell him to do such a thing. Uh, a modern example, I mean, the drowning could happen even today, is uh, an old lady slips on the ice or falls down, just falls down. Right? Do you help her up if there aren't, other, if there aren't women there? That, that would help her up, right? So uh, you want to be a tzaddik and you don't do it, but you know, uh, you have to. So it's a little dangerous because on the other hand, common sense is not always halacha. So I'm not, I, I don't think Rabbi Israel is suggesting that common sense will be the answer to things. But you need, a righteous person does need to have a certain measure of common sense to be sure that in their righteousness, they're not hurting people and they're not violating other halachas. And that's the notion of don't be a fool, meaning use your seichel to understand when is a chumrah appropriate and when is it not appropriate. Uh, this, is, this may be a strange question, but how, how does a person gain the common sense? Say again? So how does one gain common sense? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's a hard question. Uh, part of how you gain common sense it's not so common, is you hang around people that have common sense. <laughs> that's, uh, that's an important uh, idea. And uh, part of it also, though, is that um, as you learn Torah, you know, your seichel incorporates more and more. So common sense is also connected to Torah sense, which gets sharpened and developed by your learning, in which you get to see different sides of the question. Um, and again, you see this by Rehosol Salatra, you see this over and over and over and over again. The Gemara in Chulin says that even though the amount of water that you need for Natila Shadayim is very, very small, you wash your hands with a revius of water. That's four ounces. That's like less than a whole uh, plastic, you know, less than, yeah, around half of this cup. But it says the more water you use, the more bracha Hashem will give you. So that's why we use a big washing cup, because it's a bracha to be no time. Right. So they noticed Rabbi Saul Salanter was once a guest in somebody's house, and he was using the bare minimum, the bare minimum of the water. So they said, what do you mean? The Gemara says you're supposed to use a lot of water. It's a makora bracha. So Rabbi Saul Salanter said, this is before they had sinks. So when they ran out of water in the house, somebody had to go to the well or to the pump. He says, Who's going to bring the water when it gets used up? The widow that's in the kitchen? So you want to be a big tzaddik and get all sorts of brachos by causing this woman to have to go out and get more water? This is the famous statement. You want to be a tzaddik on somebody else's cheshman. That's part of the idea of common sense. Another story, again, so many, we saw Slanter, so many stories of this nature. Um, for a lot of his life, he was traveling to all sorts of small towns in France and Germany, trying to be Makarov people and the like. And in some of these towns, he had students. He had Talmudim. And a Talmud said, come to my, please, could the Rebbe come to my house for Friday? We have a beautiful, beautiful Suda. The Suda goes on for six hours, and we have Divrei Torah, and we have Zemiros. And I know the Rebbe doesn't care about the food, but the food is delicious, and, and we have guests, and Aniyim. Baruch Hashem, and with the Rebbe there would be the most beautiful spiritual experience. So Rabbi Yisrael Salanter came, but he said, I will come to you on one condition, that from Kiddush to the end of benching will be a half an hour, no more than a half an hour. No six-hour meal, 30 minutes. If you do it in 30 minutes, I will come to you. If it's going to be more than 30 minutes, I will not come to you. So the Talmud wanted Rabbi Yisrael to come, 
And the Talmud never had a meal like this. I mean, it was quick, a kiddish. They ate the food, no zemiris, no Torah. And the Talmud was heartbroken because Shabbos was a very special thing. And he thought with his Rebbe it would be so special. And it was like nothing, a half an hour meal. I mean, it was worse than a lunch during the week or, or whatever it was. So, but the Talmud was macabre. Afterwards, Rabbi Israel said he wanted to speak to the cook. He was a wealthy man who had a cook in the kitchen. And the cook comes out, a woman, again, a widow. Uh, that's how widows made their parnasa. They would cook in, in private, private homes. And uh, he apologized to the widow. He said, I know that you normally have a much more leisurely pace, and I know that I rushed you tonight, and I want to ask your mechila. And the woman said, Rebbe, this was the greatest night of my life. He said, normally, I'm stuck here until midnight. And I have a 12-year-old son. And he waits for me to come home Friday night and make Kiddush. And we have a little meal together. And I don't see him until midnight. And the whole week he's in yeshiva. And this is the first time since my husband died that I could spend a Shabbos meal with my son. So thank you so much. So we saw Salander turn to his Talmud and you say, you see why the half an hour meal was a much greater mitzvah than the six hour meal. Look at what this enabled this Almana to have in her life, to be with her son. So all of this is the meaning of common sense, the meaning of not being at tzaddik on other people's cheshpen. You know, you wake up at midnight, you want to say tikkun chatzos. <laughs> so you start wailing and crying because you're so righteous. Uh, your roommate is trying to sleep, you know, whatever, whatever it is. You know, so the roommate says, what are you making so much noise? You say, tikkun chatzos, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, you got you to gotta have common sense. Don't, don't be a fool in all of this, right? So that, that's what they're getting at, really. Yeah? I would just ask where, where you can draw the line small whims of somebody else, right? If you have a very important regular Seder and somebody wants you to just help them do something silly, but you can't, you know. No, for sure. Well, well yeah. Where you, you draw the line here? No, no, so, so it is. So again, uh, you know, there has to be a, a weighing of cost and benefits. Uh, there also has to be a question of, is something a chumrah beyond the halacha, or will I be violating halacha? If I'm going to be mavatol a seder, that's a very different thing uh, than, you know, not doing tikkun chatzos or, 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 or whatever it would be. So that's part of common sense. Again, the, the chassam server used to call it the fifth chalik of shulchan aruch. You know, we have four chalakim of shulchan aruch that give you the rules, all the rules, and that's very complicated. But the Chassam Seifer always talked about the fifth chilek of Shulchan Aruch, and that's the common sense. There is no fifth chilek of Shulchan Aruch, but that's the common sense to know how to apply, uh, apply the other four chalakim. That a person can know all four chalakim, but he doesn't have the seichel to know when to apply it uh, and when not to apply it. So it takes, it takes experience. It takes experience. It takes thought. It takes uh, consultation with, with Rebbeim and Chaberim and the like that. <clears throat> Hearing a prophet come out here, um, on the one hand, it's obviously a huge day. The whole year is basically decided my health, my nasa, everything. But on the other hand, um, like there's din b'chazer in every single day, and I could do shuvah any day. So, like, ri really, how is it different than almost any day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is uh, this is actually a very, very good question, right? Rosh Hashanah is the Yom Adin. And at least if you're a Benoni, middle of the road, and most of us hope that we're Benonim, uh, Sadiqim maybe is beyond us, Rishayim, we, we hope that we're not, but most of us fall under the category of Benonim. And with Benonim, there is what's called a preliminary judgment, called writing. God writes it in the book on Rosh Hashanah. And then, depending on what we do during Rosh Hashanah Tshuva, there's Chasima, signing, sealing on Yom Kippur. And then you have Hoshana Rabbah. It's not, it's not given to the angels in Hoshana Rabbah. Then there's Tafto Hanukkah. There, there are ways of pushing it off uh, for a very long time. But then there is some point at which everything is judged. And then, however, we say, but you know, 
You can do tshuva every day of the year. And we dive in, we dive in every day of the year. Well, at least during the weekdays. God should give us this and God should give us that. What do you mean? God, this, it was already decided. Meaning, why do I even daven after Yom Kippur or after Sukkot, whatever it would be? I mean, whatever was decided was decided. What am I asking God for? Elamai, the answer is, as you said, Yafet Shuva B'chaleis. Shuva works so all the time. So, so the question then becomes, so what is the nafkamina? And I'm just repeating your question. What is the difference between pre-Rosh Hashanah and post-Rosh Hashanah or post-Yom Kippur? whatever it would be, a mimanif shech, tshuva is going to work, or can work, if you're zocha, the whole year. So what's the special business? You're, you're right. I mean, the short answer is that um, th the process is harder, which means to say uh, it is easier to get a favorable judgment than it is to rip up an unfavorable judgment. So yes, the kayach of tshuva can even rip up an unfavorable judgment, but that is a harder thing to do. So as a result, we put in our efforts where they are most likely to yield more success, and that is to get the judgment, right? It's like, uh, I mean, lahabjol, if we can use legal process as an analogy, uh, you would rather get the right judgment than to get a wrong judgment and then have to appeal it and hope that you could change it on appeal. Uh, it's just easier to get it right the first time. And that's what we're trying to do uh, during this time of year. Yeah. Uh, in the Ramam's Hilchos Shuba, um, he discusses the, obligate, the mitzvah to do with uh, on Yom Kippur. And he discusses, I think, for example, from the Rosh Hashanah, about uh, that the obligation starts actually before the last meal. And I know it's a Rosh Hashanah, but the way that Rambam understands uh, the quote of the Gemara, he says that someone to do vidoy before the last meal because they might choke during the meal and not make it to Yom Kippur. But what was Pshat there? Why, what about the hundreds of meals before that, before Yom Kippur? So why does he care about the last meal? Does Gemara specifically care about the last meal that you might find that last meal and not be able to do vidoy? Right, right, right. So the, right, this is going on the halacha of the Rambam. And uh, remember, the mincha before Yom Kippur, before we eat the final meal, we recite the long vidoy. It's a regular weekday shmonas, right? But we recite the long vidoy of, of, of Yom Kippur because the Rambam says, based on the Gemara, that chas uh, a person might choke, a person might die before Yom Kippur, then he will not have the benefits of the atonement of Yom Kippur. So we want to be sure that at least he dies mitaych uh, tshuva and the like. So the question becomes, if you're going with the logic that a person might die before he does tshuva, then that, that potentially could happen with any meal the whole year, so we ought to say what? We ought to say, before you eat, every day of the year, recite vidoy, lest, God forbid, a person dies uh, without, without doing tshuva. What is so special that you gotta do it, uh, you gotta do it, you gotta do it now? So I, I think there are two possibilities that, that one, might, one might suggest. Possibility number one is, of course this is more Kabbalistic, so I'm not sure if the Rambam would go along with it, and that is, uh, the satan is bedafka makatreg at times of great opportunity. Meaning during the year where the power of atonement is not so great, the satan is not going to try to strangle you. But, but Yom Kippur, there's going to be more of a focus to get you because you're on the verge of something very, very, very precious. So quite literally, the risk of strangling, of choking, might be greater ere of Yom Kippur because it's a shas sakana. This would be similar to the idea that a chasan needs a guard, needs a shomer before the wedding, because that's when the shadim, the mazikim, try to get him. Uh, the other possibility is this. The other possibility is that the reason why we make a special idea here is because Erev Yom Kippur, in a sense, has an aspect of Yom Kippur to it. In fact, it, it, it's brought down that Erev Yom Kippur is the Yom Tov of Yom Kippur. In other words, you know, the Suda Mavsekis of Yom Kippur is not, why do I eat a Suda Mavsekis? So most people think, well, I eat it because uh, I want to have strength for the fast. That's true, but it's not only that. Suda Mavsekis is, Yom, Yom, Yom Kippur is a Yom Tif, and a Yom Tif should be celebrated by eating and drinking. Problem is, I can't eat and drink on Yom Kippur. So what you do on Erev Yom Kippur is the Suudas Mitzvah of Yom Kippur, and that is why 
the table has to be set like it is set on Yom Tov. Tablecloth, china, because it's not just I'm eating so I shouldn't be too hungry. This is a kiyam of a sudas Yom Tov. Now, if that's the case, then the idea is by doing vidoy on Erev Yom Kippur, you will get the kayach of Yom Kippur itself, which will not be true the rest of the year because Erev Yom Kippur has part of the kayach of Yom Kippur gufas. So that would be a possible answer. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very, very hard situation that uh, all of us face. First of all, let me just point out, one halacha is that while you are davening, you don't have to give any tzedakah to anybody uh, because you're osek b'mitzvah. Remember, the Gemara says, even if you're taking care of a lost object, I'm taking care of your, you lost, you know, I found your cow, and I'm milking your cow, or I'm combing your cow, or whatever it is, and an ani comes and... Uh, as for tzedakah, I don't have to give him at that moment because I'm osek b'mitzvah. So that doesn't answer your question totally, but one answer is while I'm davening, I don't have to give anybody. That's one thing. Um, however, uh, let's assume that, uh, you know, you finish davening and you're still going to be confronted by 20 people uh, who want some money. So me'ikar hadin, me'ikar hadin, it is brought down that anyone that asks you for money, you're supposed to give them something, but it can be very minimal. It can be a shekel, it can be ten agarot, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a lot amount of money, but still, a lot of people don't carry around a lot of change. I mean, if you have uh, bills in your pocket, you know, you're not going to be able to give uh, 20 shekel or 50 shekel bills to 100, uh, 100 different, uh, different people. So it seems that unless they're asking directly for food, if you do not know that they have a genuine need, you don't have to give them. Uh, if they ask for food, you have to give them because, you know, God forbid a guy might drop dead of starvation. But short of that, you don't. Now, the only question is this. Most of these guys do have letters. See, that's the problem. Meaning, if it's a guy without a letter, without any type of haskama, then you have the right to say, I don't give. But if it's a guy with a letter, and the letter seems genuine, at that point, you would have a chiv to give something. So that, I don't know the hatcher not to give unless you don't have the, the money or, 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 or whatever it would be. So number one, you don't have to give during davening, number one. Number two, you don't have to give uh, people who have no evidence of their need unless uh, they are uh, asking for food. But number three, you do have to give something to somebody who directly approaches you uh, if they have some documentation. Now, directly approaching you means, that's interesting, a lot of times they don't directly approach you. That means they directly ask you. If they're simply circulating, that's not the same thing as directly approaching you. And there you would be allowed not, not to give under those circumstances. Yeah. What, what if they, they sometimes like, you know, at, towards the end of davening, they make an announcement, like, so and so has 12 children, yeah, that's not, and, that's not, and then yeah, they exactly. come around and, you know, put their, put, like, so if they stick it right in front of you, yeah, then, then, then they stick yeah. the credit card machine right in front of you, <laughs> high tech, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so then you should try, you should try to give something, but it can be small, it can be small, you know, it, that's called approaching you directly, uh, Rav Chaim Kineski Paskins, mm -hmm. that mail or email solicitations, are not called are not called direct. So you get uh, now. I notice that uh, more and more, which in some ways it's good, but in some ways it increases the the burden. Uh, a lot of stucca comes from email solicitations now. Uh, 
I don't know if you, you see that. Uh, all sorts of things. Uh, and Rav Chaim Kinevsky said that, you know, you have to evaluate each case, but there's no automatic obligation that you have to send money to an email solicitation. That's not considered a personal, uh, you know, approaching you personally. Yeah. Yeah, so how does a person come to a realization that Torah is worth uh, everything? Uh, a person hears the idea, but a person may not feel the idea. And how does a person come to feel the idea? But again, a very, very excellent question. The assumption that we make, and Baruch Hashem, many people discover it that way, but not everybody does, is that the more you learn, the more the cheshek will come. Meaning to say, at some point, your neshama will feel a tremendous, tremendous sipuk and pleasure and geschmack from the learning. And the Torah itself is its own salesman, so to speak. The Torah itself is going to convince you that this is a real good deal. The Chazinish has an essay. And I, I'll admit to, to my own failure, my own weakness, I have not lived this out and carried this out. So I can't even say that I know it's true from my own experience. But he talked about someone who learns 12 hours straight without interruption. And I say, I, I was never Zoha to do that. And he talks about what you feel after two hours. And then he talks about what you feel after four hours, six hours. It's like an exponential expansion of the neshama till you mamish are like a malach in shamayim. And the, this is the chaz Now obviously the chazanish did this many times and he was describing his own connection to the Torah of Hashem. So, if a person could do that, <laughs> then we too would be able to have that type of hergish. But the Chazanish points out, if you look, read the Chazanish, you know, after three hours, after four hours, also there's something very, very powerful. Part of our problem is, you know, we never give it enough time. You know, the Chazanish gave a famous marshal. Let's assume it takes a half an hour to bring a pot of water to a boil. Half an hour. And every 29 and a half minutes, you take the pot off the fire and you cool it down. And then you put it back for another 29 and a half minutes. You're saying, it's supposed to come to boil up to 30 minutes. I have left it on this fire for five hours. You know, adding together all of the, yeah, maybe you had five hours, but you never had 30 minutes straight. And our problem, again, I'm concluding, including myself in this, we just don't give it enough time. So it, it's not pile the way it could be pile. Uh, the Orachayim Makadesh, on the other hand, says, Hashem does not let us feel consciously what our neshama feels when we learn. Because if we would feel that feeling, we would never stop. So we would die of starvation and lack of sleep. Meaning, Hashem doesn't let us feel the whole geshmak. Because we got to do other things sometimes. So Mela Hashem doesn't let us feel it. It would have been more powerful than the most powerful addiction. You wouldn't be able to break away from it. Yeah. How does, um, this kind of goes back to uh, my first question, like, like, like I asked about like, qualities that one wants to like, work on and um, to get ready for become ready for marriage. But it's just, it's a more like general question about um, just improving one's midos. Is it, is it just like hanging around people that have really good midos, telling me the chachamim, Well, remember, you know, when, 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 yeah, yes, yeah, You know, when Rabbi Shaw Salanter started what's called the Musr movement, uh, all of that, you know, we look at Rabbi Israel as such a great tzaddik and everything he said was das taira. But you know, there was a lot of opposition to him. There were gedalim that were opposed to the idea of systematic Musr instruction because those gedolim took the position that learning taira alone will make you a better person and there is no reason to specifically 
concentrate on Midos, the Torah will straighten you out. This was many people who were opposed to Rav Yisrael Salanter. The Chavitz Chaim said that Rav Yisrael Salanter was right because he said, Taira is the diet for a healthy soul. When your neshama is a healthy neshama, the Torah is the nutrition that keeps your soul functioning. But when you have a sick soul, angers, resentment, hatred, egotism, you need some specialized medicines, uh, you might not be capable of the regular diet. And that's what Musr was. And the, this is what the Chavitz Chaim said. So by and large, you know, the Chavitz Chaim's view of Rabbi Israel is that which we accept. And uh, therefore, uh, the one thing I can say is it's not enough to just learn Torah, as important as that is, but you've got to consciously work on, on Musr. Now, Rav Shlomo Volba, Zechron Levracha, who may be, I don't, I don't want to call him the last Baal Musr, but one of the great, great Bali Musr of, of our generation, who was Nifter just a short time ago, uh, wrote, uh, two, wrote a two-volume work called al Shur, huh? Yeah. Now, volume one of al Shur, which is a thinner volume, is about the hashkafa of personality development, the hashkafa of Musr. But volume two, if you notice, is a very fat book. And volume two is very, very interesting. Volume two are the practical Musr Vadim that he had. These are small group sessions. They're almost like group therapy sessions where people would have exercises to work on their midos. This month we're going to work on anger or this month we're going to work on chesed or this month we're going to work on greeting people in a pleasant way. And it was very practical, unlike Ale Shor Chelek Aleph, which is a beautiful theoretical explanation of things. Volume two is practical suggestions. He even says, some people are not going to be into this because they don't want to do the practical work. But he said the practical work is the most important part of Musa. So what they used to have in the yeshivas in Europe, they used to have Musa Vadim. Now most yeshivas don't have them, but they're offered privately. Rev. Kellerman and other people offer Musa Vadim. You could Google Musa Vadim, in which people get together. Women have their, th their own and men have their own in which we have projects in which we're going to work on our midos this year. And it involves, uh, you know, talking with people, with chaveirim. Uh, people share their experiences. People will say, oh, it's, it's like group therapy, but, but directed for the musr idea of midos. Oh, this, uh, this week I got really angry at my 13-year-old because he came late to show and I said things to him in a way that was not so pleasant. And people will talk about, well, how could you re-script it, right? So it really is work that a person goes through in which developing character. Uh, so it's a different type of learning. If you're a yeshiva type person, you might say, oh, what is this? Uh, psychology, you know, uh, I want to learn, uh, I want to learn a tesis, I want to, right? So this is not that type of thing. This is literally working on mitos. And it's a very good thing. The people that do it say that it's life transformative in, in, in like always. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was wondering, um, can the Rav uh, offer any uh, recommendations or words of wisdom on how a man can, like, like, can practically, um, what a man can do to guard their eyes? Um, yeah, yeah, guarding your eyes, um, yeah. I guess nowadays it's like, uh, Everything is like, it starts very small, and then before you know it, it's just, how do you keep yourself very strongly disciplined? And I think somewhere it says, like, uh, you're not, uh, if you know that, like, a, a woman is going to walk by a certain path, like by the, by the river or something, you have to, like, go around, you have to, like, if, do everything you can to, to avoid looking. Um, but, like, yeah. nowadays, you know, I guess there's, maybe two schools of thoughts. One, one is that if you are very, um, if you completely isolate yourself from it, then maybe it's even more difficult. But if you're a little bit desensitized, 
um, maybe it won't affect you as much. Like, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's a very interesting point. Uh, in fact, um, the issue of what's called shmira senayim, guarding your eyes from uh, sexual things, uh, lack of tzniyas and, and, and all sorts of things, is a very, very big nisayon that's much more, diff much more difficult uh, today than, than maybe it was 50 years ago. Uh, number one, the tzniyas of even you know, the non-Jewish world has gone down precipitously. Uh, and number two, uh, the internet, meaning to say it used to be that you'd have these problems only if you went to certain places. Now, it's to, you know it's available for you wherever you are. Things that you know you you could have gotten arrested for <laughs> uh, 40, 40 years ago. So the idea of shmiras hanayim is a very, very big nisayan, plus the fact that we get married later than we used to. Chazal, you know, advised people to get married at 18, and uh, that is optimal. But there are reasons why we can't do that. We're not ready yet. We're not emotionally ready. So you're hit with a double whammy because uh, you know, your sexual hormones are very, very powerful at 18, 19, 20. You're not allowed to have you know, contact with women in an improper way. And you're mechoyiv and shmira senayim. So you're being, you're being buffeted with all of these forces in which uh, you know, it used to be, you know, okay, I would get married at 18 or whatever it would be. I wouldn't have all of these, all of these problems. So it is a big nisayan, and again, it's, it's, not, it's not anything that one could take, could take lightly. Uh, you try to do the best you can. You try to avoid seeing things that you shouldn't be looking at. There are some very excellent books, English and Hebrew, on Shmiras Enayim. There's a website, Guard Your Eyes. People should check it out if, if they're struggling with this, which has articles and chizuk on this Indian. But the last thing that you brought up is a very, very interesting issue. Should my goal be total avoidance, which will never be 100%, but as close to 100% avoidance, or is a certain amount of desensitization perhaps helpful? Meaning to say, <coughs> if I habituated myself to absolutely never see a woman, never be, involved, never be where women are, never, never see anything at all, then what's going to happen is, in the rare occasions when it happens, it's going to have a power, powerful effect on you. If, on the other hand, I, I, I live life regular, I, and I try to be careful, but I, I don't make a point of never going anywhere where there'll be a woman or whatever it is, so perhaps you get a little desensitized. Now, that may sound heretical, but I want to point out that the Paiskim say such a svara. The Lavush actually writes, about separate seating at Sheva Brachas. He, he discusses the issue. Are you allowed to have men and women sit at the same table uh, for Sheva Brachas? You know, families, husband, wife, you know, etc. So the Maharshal actually said, men and women cannot sit at a, t a single table for Sheva Brachas because you have to say, Shasimcha b'maynai, that there is joy in God's abode. God has no simcha when men and women are sitting together. In fact, this is why the source, you'll notice at many chasnas, that when it's time for benching, the men leave their tables and they go to the head table, right? Uh, so the original makor of that was an American thing because in America, many chasnas were mixed tables and because of the marshal, the men wanted to separate and go to a separate table and then it got corrupted because then women followed them also. So, so it got crazy. The whole purpose was to leave the women, then the women joined. But the Lavush Paskins, not like the Marshal, the Lavush Paskins, that Bisman Azah, and this is the 1500s, this is not uh, recent, men and women can say Sheva Brachas on a mixed table because since we are more Ragil Benashim, we are more habituated to have some interaction with women, the Hirhurim are less, and therefore it's not so bad. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a sensible svar, but it's a very, very big chiddish in which the, the, the Lavush is taking Regilus Banoshim not as a weakness, but as a benefit that can allow you to have a, a greater degree of, of interaction. 
So I think it may depend on the person, but it may very well be that uh, some habituation might be helpful. But once again, you have to be very, very, very careful, you know, to keep it low, keep it very low level, and, and to, to be Zoyer, because you're putting yourself in dangerous environments. So you do have to be careful, but it could be that that might be a better way than a total, absolutely total separation. Can I ask you just a follow up question? So, yeah. the, what, what, uh, the person who held that you can't uh, be uh, older than that person? Who said you could, habituation? Marshal, Marshal, so yeah. What about like a Shabbos table where we're sitting together? I mean, what does that also mean that well, let me remind you, the marshal was not, I don't know what the marshal himself did, but, but uh, among, among Hasidim, among Hasidim, not, not all, but many, many Hasidim uh, do not sit uh, uh, with the women at the Shabbos table. And there was such a thing. In fact, this was a maestro with Rav Meir Shapiro. Rav Meir Shapiro, the great Rav of Lublin, the founder of Dafyomi, uh, was visiting Radin, and he wanted to spend Shabbos with the Chafetz Chaim. So the Chavitz Chaim said, I would be so honored. I'd love you to come and spend Shabbos with me. Ramir Shpira said, I just have one condition, that the Viber, the women, should eat in the kitchen, not, not, not sit at the dining room. So the Chavitz Chaim said, oh, I'm sorry, I have to withdraw the invitation. He says, I eat with my wife on Shabbos. I can't, uh, <laughs> he says, I don't change that. So there were different Masoras. There were different traditions about, about this.